On today's program, former host Steve Owens has lots of interesting succulents for the landscape. We travel to the Crystal Bridge in downtown Oklahoma City, where David Hillock visits with conservatory specialist Nate Shane about the history and care of orchids, and they take a taste of a ripe cocoa fruit. Myriad Gardens Director of Horticulture Casey Sharber takes us under the gardens to see the systems that make the Crystal Bridge possible. Former host Steve Dobbs talks about the exciting new horticultural changes at the Oklahoma State University Stillwater campus. And Barbara Brown prepares cabbage with caraway. Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. A lot of plant collectors really like succulents because of the variety. And some of those plant collectors probably started their succulent collection with the jade plant. Right here we've got a variegated variety of the common jade plant, but you see these in uh, lots of nurseries, lots of uh, botanical collections. They uh, develop quite a thick stem and really an easy plant to grow. You can propagate it with one leaf or stem cutting and uh, just a little bit different take on the plant with this variegation makes this one, I think, very attractive. Right up here, we've got one of my favorite calanchos. This is called the Copper Calancho from Madagascar, and I just love the color of the leaves. This coppery color comes from hundreds of little cinnamon-colored hairs that line the surface of the leaf on the Copper Calancho. Over here, we've got another calancho, this time one that comes from the country of Panama. This is the Panama calancho, and I love the blue color to the leaves, a little bit of a purple edge, and here in the wintertime, it'll actually give you some peachy orange flowers on the Panama calancho. A very popular succulent with the children is the string of pearls, sometimes called string of beads. Everybody loves the spherical shape of the individual leaves on the string of pearls. Well, right back here, we've got another plant that has some interesting leaves on strings. This is known as string of bananas. These look like little bananas. Of course, you cannot eat those, but uh, makes a great trailing plant. And we use this sometimes in a big urn where we put together a mixed container of succulents and we use this plant to spill over the edge, the string of bananas. Right up here, we've got an interesting plant. This is known as the propeller plant. And you can kind of see with the leaves here, about an inch thick, four or five inches long, beautiful silvery gray color, and kind of offset like the propeller of an airplane. The uh, propeller plant closely related to the jade and a uh, very easy, very, uh, very tough plant. Good, good one to grow outdoors here in Oklahoma. Another euphorbia that looks similar to the cactus is the corn cob euphorbia. This one is variegated, so you get that green and white mixed in. The little spines are kind of soft at first, but they do harden up a little bit. But you can kind of see the rows of the uh, parts of the plant that look sort of like the kernels on an ear of corn. We've got a plant in the milkweed family right here. This is one of the stapelias. I love those little starfish shaped flowers that this one produces. Some of the larger flowered varieties have an interesting smell that attract flies to help with their pollination. Right here, we have a sticks on fire pencil plant. It's called pencil plant because the stems are roughly the size of a pencil, but uh, these can get quite huge. 
in Somalia and places in East Africa, these are grown as living hedges and they can get to be about 30 feet tall and camels actually feed on the stems of the pencil plant. The kind of uh, orange and peach colored variegation on this plant gives it a little bit of a, 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 an extra air of excitement. Right down here, we have a burrow's tail. This is actually a sedum. It's a uh, non-winter hardy sedum from Mexico. And you see these sometimes in hanging baskets where those stems can cascade down several feet. Easy to take care of. I think a, a succulent plant in a hanging basket in Oklahoma is about the only way to go. Uh, th those uh, conditions are so tough with all the hot air and the, the wind blowing around the plant and they dry out so quick. So a succulent, excellent choice for a hanging basket. Well, some of the succulents are somewhat new to cultivation. This is another Crassula, closely related to the jade plant, one with wavy leaves. This was just discovered back in 1974, so it's just now kind of making its way around the horticultural industry. But uh, very unique. I love those, uh, those pasta shaped leaves on this Crassula. And then finally right here, we have the copper tone stone crop or the uh, orange colored sedum referred to sometimes as noose bomber sedum, sedum noose bomberanum. And we grow it in a beautiful little black pot here and we love the color combination. And uh, again, just a, a, an easy, very colorful plant that you can grow outside. But again, succulents as a group are so easy to grow. You can go on a summer vacation for a whole week or more. And once you get home, your succulents will be just fine. We're at the Crystal Bridge at the Marriott Botanic Gardens today, taking a look at their orchid show. The orchid show runs each year from mid-February to mid-March. And today we're talking to the expert of the orchids here at the Crystal Bridge, uh, Nate Shane, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on. So orchids are really fascinating. I mean, as we can see, they're pretty spectacular, and I think that's probably what draws most people to these plants. But they have a really unique history in terms of how they became popular, as well as how they operate in nature. So. Tell us a little bit about what's, uh, you know, maybe some of the, the neat stories that are behind orchids, and then maybe a little bit about the different types and how they work. Sure, yeah. Well, orchids are one of the most diverse uh, families of plants on the planet. There are uh, over 25,000 different species, so there's a lot of different types. And as you can see, a lot of them have very beautiful flowers. These are all tropical orchids, but orchids actually grow all over the planet, everywhere except uh, those completely covered by ice. So some of the different types of orchids we got here from the tropics, we got papiopetalums, the, the slipper orchids. We got phalaenopsis orchids, a lot of different kinds of those. Those are the most common types that you'll see in the, the box stores for sale. Uh, we got Catalea orchids, which these are the ones that kind of really kicked off the big uh, orchid craze in Europe because uh, they've just never seen any flowers like these before. Um, we've got intergenerics, or uh, ones that are related to oncidiums, and dendrobiums, which is another popular cut flower. Um, so the orchid craze in Europe, like I said, it started with these cattleyas, uh, but around the 1830s, people really started going crazy for orchids. Uh, they sent out uh, hunters into the tropical areas of the world to find and collect these orchids and some of them are selling for thousands of dollars. Wow. Uh, a really unique one-of-a-kind orchid could sell for thirty thousand dollars or more in today's dollars. Wow that's a um, lot. <laughs> well, there's, there's lots of fun stories that you can find about orchids nowadays. Though. Right yeah even today there's people going out into the wilds and risking their lives because uh, they're just, just so captivated by these orchids and they want to discover new ones. You mentioned there were some really interesting things and how they kind of, you mentioned they kind of trick, trick insects and, and other things to, right. and help, to help them grow and to pollinate each other, et cetera. Right. Um, so for example, we have the, the papial petalums here. Uh, they have no fragrance, they offer no nectar. Uh, most orchids don't offer any kind of reward to their uh, uh, animal or insect pollinators like most plants would give nectar. 
but that's very expensive to make. It costs a lot of energy for the plant. So instead they do tricky things like this one's kind of red, it's got spots on it, little hairs. Uh, so a fly would look at that and think, oh, there's other little flies on this thing that's kind of the color of a, a wound or a flesh. I'm gonna go try to lay my eggs on there. So they'll come and crowd around it. And hopefully some of them will slip and fall down into this pouch be a little a little water down in there like a uh -huh. pitcher plant right and they'll have to crawl up the back where the pollen is so that's how they'll, they'll pollinate ah, okay. it without having to use any sort of uh, nectar reward uh, another one that is kind of tricky are these uh, what they call moth orchids they call the phalaenopsis moth orchids because moths will in the wild look at these flowers and think it's another moth and try to go and mate with it and they'll accidentally pollinate the flower in that way. If a homeowner wants to grow these in their house, what kind of conditions work best for, for well, orchids? Most orchids like temperatures that we normally enjoy, low 70s, uh, but they usually like a higher humidity than most people have in their homes. So the best thing you can do is try to raise up that humidity, either putting them on a humidity tray or on a layer of pebbles with some water in it so that it will evaporate and kind of increase the humidity in, around the plants. Uh, most of them don't like a lot of sunlight or any direct sunlight at all. So the best spot is near a bright window, but without the light shining without directly direct on sunlight. the leaves. Okay. Yeah, and you'll know if your orchid's healthy uh, with regards to how much sun it's getting. If you look at the leaves, they should be kind of a, a little bit yellowish green, uh, not a dark green. If they turn dark, uh, you're not getting enough sunlight. And if they're very yellow, it's too much sunlight or if they're, they're scorched. Um, another thing you need to watch is the watering. Most orchids like to dry out a little bit or at least get close to drying out before you're watering them. And they like a, a well-draining mix. You need a special mix for orchids. Um, if you're growing Phalaenopsis, you can pretty much go to any store that's selling orchids to get a Phalaenopsis mix uh, or any other kind of orchid, generally a, a bark type of mix that the water just runs right out. Right out, right. So when you water them, you just want to take it and completely soak it and then let it dry and don't water it again until. And they don't require a lot of fertilizer either, do they? They like very weak fertilizer. Weak fertilizers? Often. Oh, okay. A lot of people say weekly, weekly, a weak fertilizer weak fer every week. Diluted fertilizer there yeah. every week. Okay. If you give them a very diluted uh, fertilizer, you can give them a little bit every time you water and just flush it out every once in a while. But when they're blooming, you want to cut back that fertilizer all together. So generally around winter time when they're starting to spike, you want to start, you know, cutting back, back on that fertilizer. Okay, yeah. great. So thanks, Nate. This has been very interesting. And the orchid show runs each year from February, mid-February to mid-March at the Myriad Botanic Garden in the Crystal Bridge. Hi, my name's Casey Sharber. I'm an OSU graduate. I got my horticulture degree at OSU in Stillwater. I then went on to the Longwood graduate program and got my master's in public horticulture at the University of Delaware. I worked for about five years with OSU Extension in Canadian County and Master Gardeners. And now I'm the director of horticulture here at the Myriad Botanical Gardens. Today I want to show you something that a lot of people don't get to see. And that is how we make this conservatory work. So today we're gonna to take a look at the facilities and the infrastructure, the heating units, of how we keep this conservatory hot in the winter and cool in the summertime. This behind me is what is underneath the Crystal Bridge. Underneath all the palm trees and all the beautiful tropical plants is this that makes it all work. First of all, a lot of people ask about the irrigation system. What we irrigate with is reverse osmosis water. So back there along the wall, you can see the system that actually does that filtering, and then it goes to a reserve tank to hold that. The irrigation water then is available to us whenever we turn on the spigot. Over here, you can also see um, that we have holding tanks for water. These tanks over here are for the waterfall that is on the wet side of the conservatory. In the evening, we'll have receptions and weddings, and sometimes it can get loud. So we also just turn off the waterfall for, to save energy and things like that. So the water actually comes down and is held in these tanks in the evening. So here we're looking at one of the heating and air units. We have 20 units in all. 
Five of those are only for air conditioning. 15 are both heating and air conditioning. Right now in the winter months, we have hot water going through this radiator and then it is going into the conservatory and creates this convection air. The return comes back through these louvers here and then the cycle continues. In the summertime, we turn off the hot water. We turn on water that will go down through these cool cells, just like a swamp cooler. A lot of times you see this in the greenhouse. That cool air gets pulled through and then goes into the conservatory. In the summertime, we have the louvers up on the ceiling that are open, so heat air, hot air goes up out of the conservatory. But in order to get in fresh air, we have these louvers that are open here on the floor, and this cool air comes off of the lake. As you can see, there's a lot of mechanics that are down here underneath the conservatory. And we just have a few feet of soil above us that are holding all of those tropical plants that you see. So next time you're down here visiting the Myriad Gardens, think about all the mechanics that are happening below the soil. We're at the Myriad Botanic Garden at the Crystal Bridge, and in the bridge here we have all kinds of neat tropical plants, a lot of unique plants that most people would never ever grow. And one of the plants that we have, we're looking at today, is the chocolate plant. Uh, the, the plant that we actually get the chocolate bean from. It's really quite interesting. Nate here has opened one up for us um, to show us what it looks like. Tell us a little bit about what we're finding inside. So we have the seeds, but they're actually covered by this white pulp. And it's the white pulp that gives the seeds their uh, sweet chocolatey flavor. So in order to make chocolate out of these, uh, this fruit, what they do is they take a whole bunch of these pods, scoop out all the seeds, throw them in a big pile, cover them with banana leaves and let that sit and ferment. Ah. The, uh, the pulp will break down and get soaked up by the seeds and then they ship it off to like Hershey, Pennsylvania where they roast the seeds and then you have cocoa nibs. They take the cocoa nibs and press them, and separate it into cocoa powder and uh, cocoa butter. And then they remix that together with sugar and milk and you got chocolate. How interesting. So if you just ate the seeds like right now, how they are, they'd be really bitter. They have to go through that long process first. They can hang up, they can stay on the tree for a long time. They can stay on the tree a long time. They, they mm -hmm. just go pick them when they turn orange. Okay. Start out green. And so this, this pulpy material, pulpy, pulpy stuff on our surrounding seed is really... Yeah, you can eat that now. Just don't bite into the seed. Just don't eat the seed, but that's really, really sweet. Yeah, it's rather sweet. Doesn't they make taste a, anything like chocolate. Yeah, they make, a, <laughs> they make a nice sweet drink out of this in the tropical areas. Okay, very good. Well, thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Dobbs, Manager of Landscape Services with the Division of Facilities Management here on the Oklahoma State University campus in Stillwater. Now, some of you may remember me back in the 1990s as host of Oklahoma Gardening. But I get to have the opportunity today to uh, visit with you a little bit about some of the projects that we have here on campus with uh, some of our landscape services projects. And if you've not been on campus recently, you'd probably be surprised at some of these projects. A lot is going on. Of course, it's an exciting time on the campus. A lot of student enrollment uh, increases, a lot of building projects, but we're most proud of our landscape projects. Uh, you would notice new sidewalks, many of them. Uh, one behind me here is Greek Walk. It's an uh, improved wider sidewalk with some improved uh, pavers and attention to detail. We also have some new street projects that have occurred with uh, pedestrian type sidewalks. Again, wider sidewalks are what students are wanting. Another one that's Legacy Walk, probably the core sidewalk in the heart of campus about 22 feet wide with permeable pavers even. And so again, a lot of changes taking place thanks to our, our administration who is supportive of these landscape projects, not only for the environmental benefits that they're providing, but also for assets uh, with facilities, uh, but more importantly for student, faculty, and staff recruitment. Now, as with any project, 
um, you've got to have some donor support and we're also grateful for our alumni and donors who support our campus beautification efforts and there's several of those projects that we can talk about as well but our driving guide probably would be our landscape master plan that was updated back in 2010 and implemented in 2011 and in this plan it really is a reflection of kind of how the university got here and what our goals were as far as facilities and, and directives of campus space. And it kind of is a reflection of what we've done and, and points us into the direction that we need to go. There were faculty, staff, and students involved in this um, re evaluation of the plan, if you will. And again, we've been able to implement some standards that you're starting to see now and priorities with projects. But I think one thing uh, with a campus of this size, we have a staff that's responsible for about 800 acres and the staff's very dedicated and very proud of them. But probably the thing that we've done most is just go back to training and to the basics, uh, looking at uh, water preservation and irrigation, uh, mulching practices that are the basics of basics, but so important also just uh, attention to detail and litter pickup and mowing heights and proper pruning and so many different things as well as overgrown landscapes and just trying to make sure we're choosing the right plant material for those locations. I think one of the things that we're most proud of too would be um, just the transformation of new plant material that probably is not really new to the industry but a lot of times it's new to uh, home gardeners and so we really want to invite folks to come on campus and look and see and get ideas for landscaping and plants. So really a good invitation for people to come back to Oklahoma State University and see all the changes. winter foods that we often overlook with the exception of as coleslaw is cabbage. So today I'm going to show you something you can do to actually cook cabbage. It's also nice roasted or baked, uh, but this one we're going to saute. I'm adding a teaspoon of vegetable oil to our skillet and then I'm going to add to that a medium onion. If you got a large onion, half of it will do. It doesn't have to be finely chopped, just coarsely chopped. And then you're going to let that saute on a medium heat. I'm going to turn it down a little bit because we want it to get nice and golden. It's going to take you, if you've got the heat right, uh, about five to six minutes. But you do want to keep an eye on it because if you don't uh, have the heat right, it can go from uh, lovely and golden brown to burnt very, very quickly. So just stay with it or stay in the kitchen uh, until you have a feel for what that heat level should be. Again, it should take about five to six minutes. You just want it to kind of gently turn golden, not actually getting even to the brown stage. You can see this has gotten pretty golden. We've got a few bits that have gotten a little bit darker, but I think we did fairly well here. Uh, next, we're going to add a pound of cabbage. Now, you notice that I've sliced it. I haven't gone as thin as we usually do with slaw. If you want to shorten the cooking time on this, you could do that. Uh, make it very, very thin. You could also, if you wanted to do it in bigger chunks, that's just going to extend your cooking time. So the way you cut it is really going to impact how long it's going to take you to make this dish. Also going to add about a fourth of a teaspoon of black pepper, a half a teaspoon of kosher salt, and the, the real joy to this one to me is it's a teaspoon of caraway seeds. Now if you talk with folks who are a little bit older, they will often talk to you about cabbage uh, being a cooked dish as opposed to slaw and uh, thrown into other salads. So this would be something that uh, might be a little bit retro in that regard. And I think if you've got somebody older in your family who has that experience, they're really going to like this. And I think if you have younger people, they're going to like it too. The difference th that we have here is that uh, in that retro experience, uh, if you really wanted to go true to form, they would cook this for a very long time. This we're going to saute for somewhere between 15 to 30 minutes. It could even be 10. Again, it's going to depend on how 
finally you do those slices as you go through. And if you wanted to save a little bit of time, you could actually purchase the, the uh, pre-sliced cabbage that's already ready for slaw. It would actually even uh, be quite pretty because it would have a little bit of carrot and maybe a little bit of red cabbage in there too, which is going to perk it up. But the caraway seeds really add something to me that's reminiscent of uh, uh, Germany and you want to have sausage with this. It's just a really, really good flavor combination. Again, we're going to let this cook, stirring it fairly often, but you don't have to constantly stir it until it's as tender as you want it to be. As I said in the past, people probably would have cooked this, maybe even added a little bit of broth or water to it so it would become very, very tender, cooked it for a very long time. I've still got some bite to this one. There's still some crispness to it, which is the way most of us today want, want to have our vegetables. It gives us a little bit more nutrition in there, uh, as well as a little bit more texture to it. So. Uh, it, Again, you can cook it as long as you'd like, but this looks like it's cooked about enough for uh, our purposes today. I hope you'll give this one a try. It's Caraway Cabbage for Oklahoma Gardening. I'm Barbara Brown. Here's one of the great gardening activities coming up in Oklahoma. Next week, Steve Dobbs returns to talk with OSU's urban forester about the value of trees in the landscape. Floriculture professor Bruce Dunn has techniques for grafting vegetables. And former host Brenda Sanders plants a clematis. Join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.